Thank you, everyone. Welcome back to the podcast. I'm Joshua, and today we have a very established guest, Katir. Katir, hi. How are you? Hi, hi, Josh. Glad to be here. So, Katir is a friend of mine. I've known through the music circles, and as time went on, we realized we had other commonalities. You know, very grounding and established connectivities we had. So, very happy to have a uh, someone who. Who is practicing what he preaches in that sense? Um, so um, before we begin, I will give a brief introduction. We are going to do uh, this episode on metal minds. So a very interesting dissection of philosophy of music, of mindfulness, and also sharing, you know, some of our favorite songs and all of these things. So Dr. Katerasan uh, is a PhD holder in meditation and yoga philosophy. He is an author of several books, including Mindfulness in Eight Days, and also here I have his copy here of the Advaita Vedanta of Siva Samhita. He did actually a commentary on the first chapter. So this actually is published by Motilal Banasidas, and I actually visited um, their outlet in Varanasi actually, and they have plethora of books relating to yoga philosophy and contemplative sciences. So you can check out his books here, Mindfulness in Eight Days, and also his exposition on um, Siva Samhita. Okay, so Dr. Carter Arson is also an established mindfulness teacher and practitioner with a background in yoga philosophy, organizational development, leadership, and education. And he's also known as the founding member of Vedic metal band Rudra, since 1992, Dr. Katerasan, Kater, welcome. Hey, George. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, very, very glad to be here. I, I'm looking forward to our conversations, more so about music, metal, and philosophy, which is something uh, that we usually do uh, in, in the local coffee shops when we, whenever we meet. It's great to have this online, and, and hopefully, many would also, many people watching, would also enjoy these conversations. Yeah. Yes, thank you once again. And um, both of us have this, you know, this common ground uh, with metal music. You know, we, we know how it's like playing in a band, recording music. At the same time, we also have dealt on our personal journeys with yoga, meditation, and also Indian philosophies. You know, even though we practice in different traditions, but there are a lot of overlaps in terms of meditation, mindfulness, and, you know, holistic well-being. Uh, we are both also have taken, um, you know, degrees in these various fields, right, in religion and philosophy and all that as well. So, um, and you you have given as well a lot of uh, lectures and seminars regarding um, Vedic literature, yoga, and mindfulness as well. Would you like to share with us a little bit more about this aspect? So, um, yes, I've, I've done quite a bit of um, speeches and, and presentations on these subjects, mindfulness, yoga philosophy, as well as um, what we call as Advaita Vedanta, which is one of the philosophical traditions, ancient philosophical traditions of India. And that has always been a, a passion space for me. Of course, as a, a, in the area of mindfulness, it has also become a work for me. I do that as my as, as a work uh, professionally uh, in that sense. And of course, uh, Advaita Vedanta is something that I've been interested in like for a couple of decades now. And that has been always one of my um, favorite topics because uh, that is what, uh, that is the philosophy that I resonate with very, very wholly. And I feel that uh, it allows, it, it kind of aligns with my very being. And apart from that also, um, I've also uh, spoken about mindfulness quite a bit at conferences, trying to also to uncover the neglected aspects of uh, mindfulness, especially secular mindfulness. So that has been what, uh, this is what I've been doing in the recent, uh, I think the last decade or so after uh, making a big shift professionally as well. And you can, as you know, I bring these ideas into the music of Rudra as well. Uh, it comes through the lyrics of uh, Rudra and the way that we, we present the philosophy through our music. So I, I guess it, it, it feels like I'm, I'm that one being playing different roles rather than different beings with different roles, you know. So, so I, I bring myself into the work that I do in whatever role that I play. I try to do it well and bring, and this philosophy, the, the philosophy um, guides me in that sense, the way that I you know, relate with all of these roles. Yes, definitely. And uh, what you have, uh, what you have done and currently doing is is a very unique uh, situation. Because in my personal experience as well, you know, you can find very good scholars 
you can find very good musicians, you can find very good presenters or speakers, uh, authors and so on and so forth, you know. But for someone who is on a path, you know, not just as a scholar, but as a practitioner as well, to integrate some of these disciplines and through um, direct perception and inference, we are able to, you know, share in, in, in our own channels, you know, whether as a public speaker or as a musician and the different roles, as you mentioned. So it's, uh, you know, not many people um, can do this, you know, but you are one of them. So, um, you know, I have a lot of respect for your work, especially uh, me growing up as a musician uh, in Singapore, coming through the, you know, heavy metal music and so on, the underground music in early 2000s and getting to know you and now we have been friends for a few years and sharing about these topics um so would you like to share first of all about um the inception of rudra since 1992 and next year is 2022 so i'm guessing it's the 30th anniversary do you have any grand plans about this and besides the plans would you like to share a bit more about the philosophies you include in the lyrics as well Mm. So it's, it's a very good question, George. You know, it's, it's a way to look at, uh, your question allows me to reflect on how we started. You, know, you see, when we started back in 1991, actually, to, to be honest, when we first met, of course, the band was formed and technically the name came up in 1992. You see, we were just very unhappy kids, you know, unhappy teenagers. We were all um, part of, uh, we were all students in a local institution called Nian Polytechnic. That's where we all uh, were studying the three of us, the, the three members, myself, Shiva, and Bala, who founded the band. We were just unhappy, you know, teenagers, uh, quite uh, uh, re rebellious as well, because we felt that the whole system, you know, the whole idea of having to go to school, you know, to make a living, all that, all of that, um, you know, we were just doing this reluctantly. And I, I think many, many, many kids or teenagers go through that as well. Um, but I've got no complaints uh, standing where I am right now. But at this point, at that point, we were very unhappy in that sense. I would say not unhappy in a very depressive manner, but just this, you know, like an underlying drone that, that is in your head that, you know, you don't feel satisfied with what you have. And then, uh, I mean, one of the, uh, what I call things that really rescued me was metal music because I could resonate with metal music because metal brought not just music, which was, of course, very heavy and, and something that we could relate with, but also great lyrics. I, I enjoyed, you know, uh, listening to my favorite bands, not just listening, I enjoyed reading through the lyrics, actually, especially extreme metal bands. Of course, there are heavy metal bands and rock bands. Yeah, great stuff, great music, interesting lyrics, but it was the uh, primarily the extreme metal bands that actually got me thinking. And that inspired us, you know, uh, the three of us to say, you know what, why don't we form a rock band? And probably this could be a rather not a rock band. Sorry. At that point, it was very clear. We wanted to form a death metal band, <laughs> to be honest. Right. So we said, why not we write our own music and then uh, use that as an outlet to express ourselves. And also at the same time, we wanted to be original. That was a very important criterion, I must mention. Instead of uh, when we first started out, we only played three cover songs. The, at that time, uh, we had another member. At that time, we were not called Rudra yet. But we had another member. We were four of us. And we played Sepultura, Slayer, and you won't believe it, even Nirvana. And I hated that song, Smells Like Teen Spirit, because the guy who was jamming with us, he kind of loved it. But, you know, it's that fine. He loved it and we played along with it because I, we just wanted to keep him happy as well. But we were more into the heavy stuff. And then we felt that, you know what, let's form a band. And then in 1992... Uh, the, next, the following year, we decided that we want to take a path of our own. And that's when the three of us um, gave ourselves a new name and started writing our own songs. But initially, our songs were very, very, uh, what I call very pessimistic about death, about the about uh, what we call violence and all of that. That was what we wrote because we were following the footsteps of the bands that we looked up to at that point in time. And we felt that it is kind of a rite of passage you know, for all metal bands to write about stuff like this. Uh, just like the bands that we looked up to. And then eventually we found that, you know, when we found it, we realized that this cannot go on because we felt something more deeper about our existence. We felt that maybe we, we need to be a little more authentic. That's the word. We wanted to be truly authentic to ourselves. And then we felt that maybe the best way to do it is to dig into our own cultural backyard. And that's when uh, uh, we started to look at, you know, who we are. 
as as in terms of uh, discovering our current identities and going deeper into those identities and that led us to indian philosophy and then we brought that into the music of rudra as early as 1994 we started doing that yes beautiful and um you know you've mentioned a lot of interesting pointers there so first of all like the driving forces you know for a group of people to wanting to uh work on the same goal so this kind of stress dissatisfaction uh disillusionment you know these are the kind of terms you mentioned and stress and dissatisfaction can also equate in some translations um as dukkha you know some of the many translations you can use as the term dukkha which is a sanskrit term used in um a lot of the indian philosophical traditions so you had those kind of energies going in and you also mention about um you had that you had that band member who you know I, i'm sure many people watching would pay top dollar to hear a recording of pre rudra covering nirvana <laughs> so um <laughs> Yeah, and also uh, one more thing you mentioned about the pessimism um, of some of the extreme metal lyrics, some of the content, you know, uh, discussing the harsh realities of human mm. existence, which we will speak about in the uh, some of the songs. So one of the interactive sessions we will do today is um, Katir and myself. We actually prepared five metal songs each, so we have a total of five of ten songs. Okay, within the rock and metal genre, favorite songs of ours or songs which we felt had. interesting lyrical content which we wanted to share with the viewers um using mindfulness and using introspection and also uh, regarding our holistic well-being you know about matters of the phenomena and matters of the self so um we will do about two or three songs each and then uh, we'll go into another you know series of discussions before ending off with the last two songs so kartir would you like to do the honors by choosing the first song and i will uh, choose the next song according to you Okay that sounds great man you know this is very exciting to me when you brought this idea Josh because it's it's a great way because i think people often um, what i call disregard the philosophical elements in in metal but i think it's it's very underrated people should talk more about that so the first song that i want to uh, uh present is uh, open casket by death because this was the first song that really hit me very very deep when i saw four lines in that particular song yeah open casket yeah would you like to share about uh, the lines or maybe some of the themes uh, in the song yeah yeah so the whole album which is leprosy which happens to be my possibly my favorite death album till today um so you know there were, there are just four lines in this song that really hit me so deep rather it kind of awakened me in that sense as you rightfully said the the de- defining dukkha in various ways dukkha suffering distress etc so this these are the four lines you know chuck shuldin an amazing lyricist um so he 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 says people come to pay respect taking pictures of the dead this is what life comes to be once they lived now they are deceased whoa you know when i saw these four lines george it just occurred to me the 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 whole is that you know i've been to funerals right we have we've all been to walked into funerals and that's what people do right they take pictures of the dead they they share eulogies and all of that and the very next day we forget the very person who just passed on and this is what it is and it was so real to me it's like we are just basically to be very honest not in a not in a sense of total uh what i call worthlessness of life but the whole worthlessness with respect to thinking that we will last forever rather it is not that we should end to what we had but rather the fact that we believe that we will last forever that's not true billions have come and billions have gone and this is what these four lines tell me yeah that's that's brilliant you know and uh, i knew that leprosy was your favorite album because in uh, in rudra um if i remember correctly in invoking the gods an album you released of uh, covers um there were two songs um it was forgotten past and it was pulled the plug you covered with yes. from leprosy and then when you submitted this five songs to me when i saw open casket i was like okay you know there's three references here to <laughs> leprosy um you know which is a fantastic album a lot um you know it was when chuck and the rest of the band started um they started going more deep 
as compared to the first album into the lyrics you yeah. know they, they they the the themes were more solidified as compared to the debut album and i think musically they were also slowly refining like incorporating you know off kilter rhythms and a lot of different riffs melodic riffs brutal mm. riffs and you know so i think it also added to the atmosphere of suffering in that sense you know or the themes of suffering yeah. so when i was uh, re-listening to this song after so many years also the idea of death and impermanence came up you know right. birth aging sickness and death you know and also that four lines you mentioned um and not only this song but the rest of the album um leprosy by death um the themes spoke about the harsh realities and sometimes morbid interpretations of living and dying so i think this was what i i actually uh, you know um after re- listening after so many years and with the meditations and philosophical inquiry i've come come up with this so yeah thanks for sharing about um death um I, and then now i will share uh, my song uh my selection of songs so you have chosen death open casket and so i think i will choose um cynic's veil of maya so cynic has been my personal favorite band since i was 16 years old um back in the 2004 when i first heard focus in 2004 um you know just picking up the guitar and after a few months um getting getting to know this band which feels like death metal um progressive rock jazz fusion world music and so on and so forth and the lyrical direction of the album as well was you know about self and philosophical inquiry in a sense you know existentialism epistemology and so on and so forth and i was very inspired I, i i went online to find any interview i could find about the band to see what their influences were and when i saw um some of the written interviews done by Paul Masvidal who also played in death um he also mentioned about you know uh Paramahansa Yogananda being a very big influence um Mahavishnu Orchestra also a jazz fusion band from the 70s and i went out to buy all the Mahavishnu albums i could find at borders at that point you know at Wheelock place and i bought Yogananda's book as well at 16 years old and then when i was 18 i was given another book for my birthday uh or yogananda as well so i started getting into those things more deeply um you know around my teens actually so cynics veil of maya this was from focus in 1993 coincidentally katis rudra also has a track of the same title from brahma vidya immortal i 2005 um yes so, right <laughs> so maybe we will uh, ask a little bit about his perception of veil of maya uh, after, uh, in a bit so maya is seen um you know as of in in if we translate the term you know different scholars have equated it and different schools as well you know not no need not only in hinduism or buddhism but also in jainism and sikhism this term is used and if we look at some of the meanings it could portray it could mean illusion deception pretense and magic but a form of magic trick you know illusory kind of perception so there's this lyric um perceiving thus a delusive world of duality you know there's this kind of a uh, vocoder effects which sounded very spiritual and angelic to me at that point um perceiving thus a delusive world of duality so when i started to reflect that this what is this maya ahamkara this lyrics in the song veil of maya perceiving a delusive world of so i started to look more into yogananda and other disciplines and now reflecting on it about 17 years later um i've i've come to see that um the the various schools of thought in indian philosophy they use this term within their own context but most of them point towards the term as referring to a misperception and misidentification of taking conventional reality as the ultimate reality so the world of phenomena as taking to what is substantial or ultimate or so on and so forth so i think in the case of the song also when he mentions about the charmer you know that you know a kind of a seductive element towards the end of the song i kind of see that it's a kind of a, a, a the, the seductive charm of maya of delusion and ignorance it's is a very seductive thing which um a, along with delusion and ignorance it pertains to taking the phenomenal world as natu- nature of reality so i think this was some of the reflections um i had from veil of maya by cynic but i would like to hear kartis input uh, on this song and also on his song with rudra Yeah, good one, George. I totally agree with you. The fact that you said that it's actually a misidentification and and um, 
uh, and a misunderstanding of um, reality. And I think the, the part where Cynic um, mentions that as something that is delusive and, and that's, that's totally something that I resonate with. But the couple of other things that, uh, that um, in, in addition to what you've said, uh, total agreement, which is the fact that Maya is, instead of looking at it as a power, that is um, something that is outside me, that is creating this world of duality, actually that Maya is, is actually just delusion of misperception of not seeing things as they are. So therefore Maya is not an illusion, definitely not an illusion because if it's illusion, then I'm not the wielder of Maya. In fact, I look at Maya as being seated on me and because I don't know what it is, therefore I delude myself into seeing things the way they are not. So the, the, the etymological um, derivation of Maya in Sanskrit is that which is not. So that which is not, because as you have said very, very beautifully, it is not, not, is not absolutely real. However, it is empirically real. So this is a very, very key distinction that I would really make. So Maya means an empirical reality, which depends on many things, which depends on many other things. But however, the reason why I recognize or I see Maya is because of the fact that I am ignorant. I don't know what reality is. I don't know who I am. And therefore, I see it. So this delusion, which is very, very much seated in ignorance, and that causes Maya. So I don't, I don't see uh, Maya as a power, perhaps, but actually it is seated in me. And because of me that I have this delusion, and because of this delusion that I see the world of duality or multiplicity. Lovely. Thanks for adding to that. So uh, would, you, would you also say that your explanation here, that adding on is also the element you have taken it into the song you wrote with Rudra as well called Veil vale of Maya? Yeah, yeah definitely. Um, I would definitely say that. And, and the, the key thing that we need to see is that this veil of Maya, because when you use the word veil, there's always this particular point about um, having to unveil, right? Because when you veil, so when there is a veil, we want to unveil it. So this veil of Maya is very interesting. You don't have to unveil it. Because you know why? It is not there in the first place. So the fact something that is not there cannot be, un if something is not there, you cannot unveil it. So this whole veil is as though it is there. But the moment it is known, it just vanishes. Totally. So something which is not substantial, uh, substantially or essentially there, ultimately yes. it's not there. So yeah. um, with that, uh, you know, sharing on uh, Cynic and Rudra's Veil of Maya, would you like to share your second song for the afternoon? Sorry, my second song uh, for the afternoon would be from Megadeth. All right. Now, this is again, if I'm choosing songs that I listened to very early in my life because these were the, one, these were the ones that planted the seed for me. So this brings, uh, that, that brings me to the next song by Megadeth from the album Rust in Peace. I, I love that album uh, till today. And uh, the song that I'm referring to is called Holy Wars. And, and again, uh, this, this is a, a wonderful uh, lyrics by Dave Mustaine. And uh, I'm going to just quote four lines that I've written here, which says, brother will, kill, brother will kill brother, spilling blood across the land, killing for religion, something I don't understand. And to be very honest, I have the same feeling ex exactly as those four lines. You know, people kill in the name of religion, kill in the name of religious differences. And the funny thing is the purpose of religion is to bring peace. And when that, when that, when that, I, when ideolog ideology becomes a weapon in the hands of the faithful, I really doubt if they are the faithful. Right. Uh, I, I just can't reconcile that. Right. Because all, um, founders of religions or philosophies, I mean, any, any device that, that brings awakening enlightenment, I think all of these founders and people who are inspired this, they, they never resort, they never, they never went, they, they never chose violence as a means to peace. They, all of these uh, inspiring teachers, they went, they, they actually found that within them. 
and they wanted to do what well, what they wanted to do was self transformation not self destruction no, none of these teachers taught self destruction every teacher every founder of a religion or a, or a faith or a ideology they wanted self transformation so whenever i see these four lines it constantly reminds it constantly remind me um, that violence when people kill each other in the name of religion i really i i just can't I just can't see the fact that these could be truly religious people. Not that I disagree. I know that I agree with their doctrine or dogma. That's not the point. Is that that's that's not that is not something. I may not have the conviction that they may have, but we certainly know that every religion, every faith, uh, wants to bring peace within and without. So when this happens, I just don't understand. That's why, as what Dave Mustan says, something I just don't understand. Yeah, thanks for sharing. It's a great song you chose. Uh, I was thinking of doing a Megadeth song, but I know you you were also a big Megadeth fan, so I chose Metallica. But Megadeth has been my favorite thrash metal band for as long as I could remember as well. And you chose, uh, you know, a very uh, a song which is was very current at that time. Holy Wars, the punishment due, and not only at that time, but throughout various points of human history, especially now we see what's happening in Afghanistan. So Holy Wars, the punishment due. Um, uh, also, it's very interesting because um, this album was released in 1990, and the first Palestinian uprising occurred in 1987. So this was the rebellion to what was was happening between the Israel and Palestinian conflict, ah, uh, religious violence and so on and so forth. So the Palestinian uprising in 1987, it was a response to the escalating attacks and the endless of occupation. So I think um, in one of the lines he mentioned, like they killed my wife and my baby. I think it was already looking towards, uh, you know, those kind of uprising, the Palestinian uprising. But also the line, um, "Do you kill on God's command?" And then at the end he mentioned mercy killings. So you know the idea of holy war or the misinterpretation of jihad, right? Is a misinterpretation of jihad because self annihilation. Um, You know, it's more towards, uh, you know, it's it's a very deep philosophical inquiry, right? Of overcoming mm. this false false sense of self, of being separate with the rest, and also, and and you know, but people have taken self annihilation too literally in a form of religious violence to oppose right. uh, ideological differences and all that. But in Indian traditions, we use the term ahimsa, non violence and non non harmfulness. So I hopefully you know this is one of the lessons we can learn is to cultivate more ahimsa, more non harmfulness. You know to actually resolve the conflicts we have within ourselves, right? Because most of these external conflicts are a result of internal conflicts themselves. Mm. Truly, totally agree with you, Josh. The point that you made, um, the fact that an external conflict is actually a disturbance that starts from within. Right, an external conflict is actually a disturbance within that create. Then it it kind of pushes us to commit injury and harm. And and the strange thing is, uh, when we commit harm or when we commit injury or we inflict injury onto others, now what what the what what becomes the biggest challenge is the fact that it happens uncontrollably. Now that tells us something very interesting: the fact that I'm not in control. So this is uh, a great revelation for anyone. The fact that I, when I injure someone, I harm someone, and that happens uncontrollably, then it's like, hey, it's time to look at yourself. Instead of looking, trying to fix the problems of the world, maybe it's it's time that you fixed yourself. Or let me put it the other way around. When I rather, I don't want to say externalize this. When I see conflict, it means that I need to fix myself first. I'm not saying there are no conflicts. Conflicts can be resolved in many different ways, and it can be also resolved peacefully. And I think uh, when we uh, look within, it gives us an opportunity to resolve conflicts peacefully. Definitely, thank you for highlighting that about peaceful resolution of conflicts. You know, whether it's within personal inquiry or even within having roundtable discussions to speak about those topics, because right now. Um, you know, it's so much important in various areas of our life to sit down and have discussions, right, and see how we can mitigate damage limitation or even to overcome eventually. You know, uh, and also to, uh, but it comes from within, as as what we are both highlighting here. So I hope for the viewers as well, uh, it gives some kind of an insight, a kind of, um, you know, a kind of a sharing that 
evokes the sense of personal self-responsibility when it comes to self and the world. So you have chosen Megadeth, right? You have chosen Death and I've put Cynic, now Megadeth. So Metallica uh, seems like the <laughs> close comparison in terms of you know stature, but uh, slightly higher stature. So the first Metallica song I heard, um, Wherever I May Roam, and it's still my favorite song. And even, uh, even though I've not heard this song for a long time, but um, in the recent month, I saw them perform this on the Jimmy Fallon and they were on, uh, sorry, sorry, on uh, Jimmy Kimmel, Kimmel and Fallon and all the various shows. And, I, and, and they were performing different renditions of it. Um, but this song, I, I really feel about this song because um, I like traveling, right? And when I, when I, <laughs> when I saw um, the behind the scenes, if I'm not mistaken, I think around 2002 or 2003, uh, early 2000s, there was a VH1 behind the music on Metallica, if I remember correctly, about 20 years ago now. And I think they mentioned briefly that Wherever I May Roam was actually a song about their touring and traveling experiences. You know, at that point with the Black Al uh, the, the self-titled album, also known as the Black Album in 91, they escalated uh, to the point that they were playing sold-out arenas, like football stadiums and big concert venues, you know, which they never had with their first four albums. So uh, I kind of felt that it was a kind of a personal liberation in terms of touring, but it was also uh, a little bit like, you know, whether it was voluntary, involuntary, I also questioned that in certain lyrics of the song. So I would like to share also from my personal reflection on the song. It's from the lyrics, it's like more like a person who lives in solitude, living on the edge of society, away from convention, right? So we can see here with the pre-chorus, like Rover, Wanderer, Nomad, Vagabond, call me what you will. So it's like that Rover, Wanderer, Nomad, Vagabond. And when we look at various cultures, you know, whether it's the shamanic cultures in different traditions or even the yogis and the sannyasins in India or the Himalayan regions, we see people living off the edge, you know, rovers, wanderers, you know, wandering ascetics and prophets and uh, so on and so forth, you know. And it also, um, I kind of fend, uh, felt from the lyrics and the energy, this kind of sense of liberation, this aspect of having freedom and autonomy a sense of individuality and self-expression according to one's own will. Because he said in the lyrics, but I'll take my time anywhere. I'm free to speak my mind anywhere. And I'll redefine anywhere, anywhere I roam. So where I lay my head is home. So you can see where I lay my head is home, anywhere I roam. is also like a kind of a conscious decision. But at the same time, there's a kind of, a, it's like a self-expression, a kind of a rebellion towards conventionalism, you know, right? Living on the fringes of society. So when I was listening to the song and, you know, you had the kind of a sita emulation with, the, with, with, with Kirk Hammett and all that at the beginning, um, it also reminded some of the very famous, you know, poetry, you know, like uh, Rumi, the Persian poet and Sufi mystic. So Sufism is a mystical sect of Islam. And there are a lot of... Uh, Rumi has written a lot of poetry about, you know, in terms of self-realization and especially through traveling and journeys, but not only external journeys, but internal journeys, but both at the same time also. And I also drew that, um, you know, Joseph Campbell, he wrote the book um, Hero with a Thousand Faces in 1949. And from page 23, he actually mentioned that a hero ventures forth from the world of the common day into a region of supernatural wonder. Fabulous forces are there encountered and a decisive victory is won. The hero comes back from this mysterious adventure with the power to bestow boons on his fellow men. So even this aspect of a liberation journey going towards self-discovery and through travel internally and externally is a very powerful tool. And I always differentiate being a tourist and being a traveler, you know, in this aspect. So, um, you know, I think a, a, a traveler is someone who's a genuine seeker. He will be all, all, he will be classified as a tourist, but a tourist not necessarily is a traveler. But travelers can be considered as tourists because of, uh, you know, the, the border restrictions we have or the char characteristics. So I think it's very important uh, in regards to our human experiences, this sense of, sense of self-exploration from what I get from this song. Do you have any words to add to this, uh, you know, one of the best singles?
Yeah, I mean, it is. I mean, I must say, I, I'm not sure if you, if you knew this. I'm not a fan of Metallica, to be honest. Um, I'm not a big fan of Metallica, neither am I, uh, I would say, a fan. But I must say that I'm, f- I'm a fan of a couple of their albums. Now, number one is, of course, and Justice for All was the first. Um, the first, uh, first stuff that I heard was Creeping Death. But the first full album that I really appreciated was Injustice for All. And I must say, uh, Black Album is also happens to be one of my favorite albums of Metallica, as well as the highly controversial and criticized Sin Anger. I love Sin Anger as well. So these three albums happen to be my favorite uh, Metallica albums. And I also like Master of Affairs to a certain extent. But at this point, I want to just make one point. I've always found James Hetfield to be a great, uh, a great lyricist. He's an awesome lyricist. And I always felt that he was very in touch with himself when, uh, when writing these, uh, these l- l- lyrics to his songs, because they are very, uh, sometimes very highly reflective, as you have mentioned very well in, in the song, Wherever I May Roam. And in the Black Album, on the same album, my favorite song happens to be Holier Than Thou. I thought that was an amazing song, musically as well as lyrically. Yeah, yeah very interesting. You pointed out Saint Anger because Saint Anger is also an album I actually like. Um, you know, uh, it's very controversial uh, to, to some of the fans or to other listeners. But it was one of those albums. I think it's the only Metallica album um, which I feel this sense. I mean, you can compare it in a sense to the uh, the first album as well, like the raw intensity and honest honesty. In you know, it's not to say that the other albums lack honesty and uh, it, uh, integrity and all that. They had they had that in their first five albums at least. But with Saint Anger as well, um, you know, there was this sense that he came out from a rehab and all that. There were a lot of stories we saw in the documentary, you know, and some kind of monster. So. There were a lot of personal struggles. So I think, yes, you mentioned he's a, he's a great lyricist and sometimes the pre-chorus to the chorus, he adds in the right words, which can evoke emotion, you know, for the listener. You know, they might not be very, very, uh, they might not be very, you know, very big words, but it points to the point and it's very poetic. So definitely great lyricist. I agree with you. So with that said, uh, would you like to choose your third song? Then I choose mine. Then we go to a, a little discussion before the last two songs. Sure, man. My, my third song would be uh, from Black Sabbath. All right. Now, this was uh, my introduction to Black Sabbath was uh, through a Greatest Hits album. And I remember this, uh, this particular song. It was actually named wrongly on that album. It was called Snowblind right on the on the um, album but actually it's the the song wheels of confusion and i got to know that a, a few years later actually because um, a few few probably one or two years later i got to know that it was a mistake and and um, now why why i liked again uh, this song uh, wheels of confusion because of its pessimism actually to be honest now so if you realize that there's one trend that i think all philosophers or people who like philosophy go through is that there is a, a kind of a push Something that, and that revolves around Dukkha. Now, without Dukkha, uh, somehow the mind does not get um, what I call compelled to discover the opposite of Dukkha or what removes Dukkha. Un- unless and until I see Dukkha, which is discomfort, distress, suffering or whatever, there is no impetus to want to find the solution to it. So these early songs always remind me of that because they, they revealed that they made that Dukkha is so clear to me, it became so compelling. And that too, through a favorite genre of music, metal, right? So here, uh, these uh, five lines, again, uh, I, I'm going to just read out. So uh, it says, so I found that life is just a game, but you know, there's never been a winner. Try your hardest, you'll still be a loser. The world will still be turning when you are gone. Yeah, when you are gone. Again, so the whole fact that the world will still be turning when you're gone, Mix made me very humble. Now, I felt that it, at the, when you look at the world, I'm insignificant, actually. The fact that I believe that I can contribute to the world and change the world, it's actually a sense of delusion to me. So this, that was a great learning for me. It was early, early 90s, my friend. And I saw that actually the fact that we think we're going to do something big, you know what? That too would pass away. Right, whatever that we think that we're going to impact the world, 
it's so insignificant in the face of time and the, in the face of space that we are in. So when I saw that, I realized that, you know, that, that, that ego or rather that egoism uh, that, that is associated with success, with fame, with all of that just got extinguished for me when I saw that. And my further, uh, what I call exploration into philosophy, Advaita Vedanta, was the, it helped me to nail that final nail onto that coffin, you know, final nail in that coffin, and it completely closed that forever. Brilliant. The third and fourth album by Black Sabbath, my personal favorites as well, Master of Reality and Volume 4. Um, I wasn't surprised you would choose a Black Sabbath song. Black Sabbath has been one of my all-time favorites um, alongside Cynic and Megadeth. So I remember when I picked up the guitar also, I, I, I learned some of the popular songs, you know, more, more, more popular songs from their first eight albums as much as I could. So, you know, um, I can't remember for this song though, whether the main lyricist was Bill Ward or was it Ozzy Osbourne, but I think, uh, it, it, I mean, you know, not, not so important, but I think what I'm trying to, uh, to ask you as well is, do you think that, um, you know, he's mentioned about the, the miseries, right, um, with Wheel, Wheels of Confusion, but do you think there's a sense that I've, I'm compelled to fate? You know, do you think he's kind of putting, I kind of got that feeling that, yes, it's, yeah, yeah. you know, but I'm compelled to fate. Yes, a kind of resignation, right? As, as you have said, right? There's a certain degree of resignation that no matter what you do, you'll always be a loser in that sense. Because, I mean, I totally agree with you in that sense, but I'm not saying that it is kind of fatalistic, but rather the fact that you could be a winner in something, but you could still be a loser at the same time with respect to another thing. The fact that you cannot be a winner in all, at, in, all, in all the fronts that you're in, in all the aspects of your life, it's impossible. So the whole idea of winning and losing becomes so relative, right? There is no winner. You, you could win a game, right, of tennis or in soccer, but you could be a loser in, in, in another part of your life. At the same time, it could coexist. So when one, you know, kind of, uh, kind of balances out the other, there is no such thing as winning and losing again, right? So you, we hold on to one thing, but at the same time, we don't see the rest of the thing. So, you know, we gravitate towards what we like and we don't see that actually we are far bigger than the win, the, the win that we had, the success that we had. But that makes, to me to, for me to see that, it just makes me feel that I'm insignificant and that allows me to actually be who I am. I don't have to be anyone else. There is no superimposition on my identity. I'm just this naked consciousness as I am. And there's nothing more to it than that. Yeah. And also, you know, you mentioned about winning some and losing some. And then it uh, reminded me of a Motohead as well, right? You win some, lose some. It's all the same to me, you know, from Ace and Spades. So, <laughs> and, and, and win some, lose some as well, right? I mean, when we look at it, there's also pleasure and pain and all that, you know, this... This, you know, this kind of a scaling balance, which really does not lead us to any form of liberation, uh, at least within the schools we follow. So um, with, that being, with that being said of your third song, I will choose my third song before um, we, we, you know, I have some other questions here. So you chose Black Sabbath and I think I will, I will, do, I will use that with Voivod. So Voivod has been a very big influence on my playing style, especially... Um, Musically, Voivod and Cynic, especially with the chords they use and song structure. So this song is called Killing Technology from the album of the same name in 1987. Um, there are various themes on this album. And I think even on this song as well, um, there were very different themes in different verses as well. But it all circled around technological advancement or at least the dangers of technological advancement, over-reliance in the digital age, artificial intelligence and transhumanism, cloning and alien invasion. So there are various things he spoke about in this song and the album. There's this, there's this uh, verse I really liked a lot. I think it was the end of the first verse. So, Computers controlling your functions seems like we got electronic alien alienation, trading children for a new kind of robot, waiting for the old people to disappear. <laughs> and then, you know, it goes into growing technology, fooling technology, killing technology. <laughs> and it goes into the court breakdown. So I, I, I like to highlight also, you know, it's like the mindless possession 
by technological gadgets, for example, we see now with our usage of um, the iPhone, you know, like binging over Netflix and all this, you know, it's almost like mindless. It's like almost a habituated mindlessness. Um, I also like to highlight that, you know, um, it's almost like the, the, towards the end of the song, it's like losing our awareness of ourselves and our environment and heading into a submissive and depressive dystopia almost in that sense you know so this kind of reflection of how the digital age and robot technologies are coming and all that it's also dependent upon the user being subjects as well right about the observer and the observed how we as well are you know we sometimes are not say we are giving our power or actually centralizing our power with these kinds of addictions and over reliance so it's also brought brought me this question what does it take to be human and what entails human flourishing? A great question, my friend. I mean, uh, I, 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 it's, it's a very interesting point that you brought. Now, am I, a, am I a master of technology or am I a slave to it, right? Uh, so that's a, that's a great question. And we see um, the fact that uh, the lyrics kind of foresaw, right? Uh, the future so well. <laughs> so that's so interesting. But I, I totally agree with you on that. I mean, I see the, the, the whole part about engaging with technology is nothing but actually a distraction from myself. Now, a lot of times we, uh, as human beings, we tend to be afraid of our own thoughts. Like how many of us are comfortable with silence? How many of us are comfortable just being with ourselves with no engagement whatsoever with people or devices? Now, when I, when I commute, Right, I see people who are who are glued to their phones. They are glued to one thing or the other. So it looks like we have been programmed to think that success and and uh, what I call being human would mean that we need to be engaged all the time to the point where now we feel that those external engagements that we get indulge in have become distractions from ourselves. The only times, the only time that we probably spend. Uh, uh, what I call in solitude is the few minutes before we go into sleep. That's the only time where we will, where we willfully engage ourselves uh, in solitude. So that's why I'm a great um, advocate of mindfulness and meditation because it helps you to just be with yourself, and it helps you in in bringing enhanced awareness about yourself and the world that we are living in because it's like a pause from this distraction. And we are an autopilot, my friend, right? We are constantly an autopilot. Like I've been, we, when we have nothing to do, our hands would naturally reach out for the smartphone or reach out for the laptop or the devices or reach out to con talk to people because we think that doing is the only function of being a human being, but we are called human beings, not human doings, right? right? So we think that we are supposed to be doing all the time. No, we are human beings which means that here the word being would mean that we have the capacity to be wise and that wisdom arises from, whether we like it or not, a certain level of introspection. And that's how I see it. And technology could be a real obstacle if we, in, if we were to invest too much value on it. So I think there is value in technology. For example, without that, we cannot have this discussion today from where you are and where I am. And that is, that is a great value in it. But there are also limitations uh, to it as well, especially when it comes to what you have said, human flourishing. Yes, thank you for highlighting those points. And for those people who have, uh, you know, who are joining us halfway or whatnot, I will include um, Kati's work with Rudra in the comment section uh, on YouTube and Instagram and whatnot. So uh, feel free to subscribe to the channel and to check out other episodes I've done with um, other, other practitioners, all based around mindfulness and meditation, but people from different backgrounds and disciplines. So uh, with that being said, with what Kati has mentioned, we still have two songs each, but I would like to go in a short pause here where um, when we go into the realms of mindfulness and one of the very famous um, you know, teachers of mindfulness, John Kabat-Zinn. So he has defined mindfulness, um, and, and you've mentioned this in some of your lectures I've seen on YouTube as well. One of the ways he defines mindfulness is the awareness that arises from paying attention on purpose in the present moment and non-judgmentally. So we have these four facets. 
So with that being said, if we are using this as a kind of a, you know, this is a kind of a foundation and we are speaking about mindfulness and meditation and philosophy and music and creativity and all that, how, how have you personally benefited from the practice of mindfulness through these decades? I think the, the practice of mindfulness actually allows us to, um, two things. Now, it, it, it leads to, firstly, a, a kind of a, a decentered witnessing experience to phenomena. That means you, you, you say, I always say this, mindfulness allowed me to say that I, am, I, I'm not, I notice that I'm angry as opposed to I am angry. There are two different statements. I am angry is uh, the word M is, uh, is, is similar to the equal sign. I am angry would mean that the whole being is angry. No, I'm not. Right. So I'm aware that I am angry is quite different from saying I am angry. So this distance, as I call it, the witnessing consciousness that, 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 my, that the very being of everyone is. Now, that is one great, um, what I call gift that meditation, mindfulness or even insights could generate. But the second one is by when through mindfulness and meditation, one thing that we can discover is that we realize that we are less stressed and we are less anxious and we become what I call more in control of what we, what we intend to be and also create a, a lifestyle or behaviors around what we want to be and how we can get there. So in that sense, I find, uh, I, found, I find mindfulness, meditation, all of them to be very useful in creating this awareness. Um, so in that sense, I would say that this has also allowed me to appreciate things that I may not like. Now, this is the beauty of, um, I think, when we look at things non-judgmentally, we learn to listen, we learn to appreciate things that I don't like or I'm not familiar with. Like currently, uh, Rudra, the band that I'm in, we are collaborating with classical Indian musicians uh, because that's going to be an upcoming performance that we're going to do the first time possibly ever globally, I think, where our extreme metal band brings uh, classic Indian classical musicians on stage uh, in a performance. And one thing that I noticed was I'm, not, I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a total greenhorn. I mean, I, I had some classical training, but I don't know anything about Indian musical systems. So when, when we work with them, it allows us to do that without judgment, rather with appreciation. So I would say it's an exercise in humility when we work with people who are masters in their craft. And when we meet them, we, we, we have this appreciation for them because you know why? I'm not judging them anymore. I'm appreciating uh, what they have and what they bring into the room. And that's what uh, awareness does, right? Because awareness is always not non-judgmental. Now, that's, I think, is the, one of the great gifts that contemplative practices, uh, meditation practices, mindfulness practices could possibly bring. Thank you, Katir, for sh sharing with us your personal insights and the benefits of mindfulness and meditation. And I hope that, um, you know, for the viewers, um, at some point when you tune into this, that you will find this very inspirational and it also allows you to go into introspection to explore some of these areas and try out non-judgmentally, you know, some of these practices, which, which, you know, Kartir has been practicing for, you know, for several decades and myself also for over a decade. So there are many benefits, as you mentioned, you know, you feel less, less stressed and all that, you know, you feel much more at peace. There's this kind of also being in the moment, right? And you are intentionally and consciously doing it, which is so important. You know, so we are also creating very creative habits here and also to improve our attention span, to also improve our sense of listening to people and also to be mindful of how we actually uh, function within ourselves and society at the same time. So the, um, uh, with that being said, I would also like to, um, you know, touch really briefly on one point. You know, um, because both of us, we are, we, we, we are in different, di different areas and disciplines, you know, from the university environment to maybe even some aspects of uh, contemplation sciences, music, yoga, and so on and so forth, you know. So sometimes you meet people who are in certain areas like this, and there's this kind of a stigma I've, I've experienced sometimes. 
So, for example, let's say in spiritual circles or communities, you know, or, or whatnot, let's say people who are into sound healing and meditation, mindfulness, yoga, so on and so forth, and the various practices also in the new age uh, system. Sometimes it's like, oh, you play music? So they, they kind of think like you're into like, you know, uh, kirtans or, you know, you, they have this kind of impression. Oh, if you are into yoga, if you are teaching yoga, you are into spirituality, you have to play this kind of music, which, uh, you know, they have a certain expectation. And I have experienced for myself over the last 10, 15 years as well, when they realize that you're into meditation or and all these things and you are playing in a metal band and you're writing songs about death, destruction, the harsh realities. Um, you know, I also include philosophical aspects just like you, but just the aspect of saying metal music, it creates a kind of a stigma and it creates a kind of a face like, uh, like you know, I get a lot of weird looks I've gotten. So uh, how, how can we overcome this kind of stigmas and what can you actually share about the empowerment of metal music and what metal music can bring towards our mindfulness? I think... Um, um... The genre of uh, music metal is a serious note in mundane life. That's how I put it. All right. It's a very serious note. And sometimes, you know, there, there are just like there are different genres in movies. There are times that you watch, uh, you know, people like horror movies. Some people like roman romance movies. Some people like psychological thrillers. Now you have a preference. And likewise, I think metal too is like a genre of preference. Now, there is no necessity for us to say that one genre is better than another. I think that's, that's, that's very delusive, actually, to think that one is better than the other. But rather, what's required is an acknowledgement that I like this. Now, a preference or something that we like is entirely dispositional. Like, for example, I like coffee. Why? Because it tastes like coffee. Now, can you go deeper than that? You can't, because that's how a like operates. When I like something, now, you like it because it is so. The question then is, if there is one question that I would ask for us to perhaps to answer whether, whether one should like something is basically whether it contributes to wholesomeness. That's the fundamental question. Now, if I, once I was out with my wife and then there was some classical, no, it was not, it was, it was not classical music. It was actually a new age music. So I was telling my wife, you know what, this music that I'm hearing is so depressing. And then she was laughing at me because it could not be depressing for another person, but it was depressing for me. Can you see that? That's what's called a preference, right? So the question now is we need to acknowledge that there could be preferences. We may like different things, but the ultimate question to ask whether one should even entertain those preferences is whether it contributes to wholesomeness. Now, if it contributes to wholesomeness, then the question is why not? If classical music doesn't hurt anyone, it helps you to be in touch with yourself, why not? If heavy metal allows you to be in touch with yourself and you like it, why not? Because it is not contributing to any kind of violence in any way. So I think that the key question here is whether my preference or whether the thing that I like, whether does it contribute to unwholesomeness or wholesomeness? If it contributes to unwholesomeness, then I believe that's a big question that you should think about. Uh, something that is con something that is what I call worthy of concern. If it is not, then I don't think it's an issue. For the mere reason, if I want to give a very simple reason, is the fact that today metal is a is a, what I call is a it's a ca category in the Grammy Awards, right? So I don't need perhaps anyone's approval, at least in this point in time in human history, that metal is a legitimate genre for anyone. Yes, and also. Um you know, this kind of different nuances and all these different categories and labelings as well, all the different myriads of phenomena. And at the same time, at the same time also, as you mentioned, a very important point is whether it's contributing towards wholesomeness or unwholesomeness. So wholesomeness in a sense of holistic integration, of feeling ease with oneself, it being able not only to cope with the sufferings of art realities, but also able to to have this kind of ease, you know? And if it's it's like it's like a painter with different colors on the palette, you know, some people would prefer different strokes, different kinds of mixture of colors. But at the end of the day, if it's therapeutic for someone, if they are actually using it in a very um, constructive manner, 
uh, for oneself and to empower others, I think it's a fantastic tool. However, at the same time, if it's contributing to one, to go into addiction even deeper, um, to mix around and, you know, to contribute with certain societies to contribute towards um, unwholesomeness, then I think, you know, it's also about our level of perception and our actions as well. So at a, while it can be very empowering in that sense, um, also it really depends on how we actually uh, conduct ourselves in regards to this. So with that being said, uh, we have two songs each before we wrap up uh, with a last question. So Kati, would you like to go first with your second last song? All right. So now um, from pessimism, I'm going to move into um, uh, the, the other side, which is the opposite, right? The, the solution, right? Uh, as as it's an evolution for me as well from, you know, from, from the way I, uh, how he, metal music inspired me is through pessimism. And then you look at optimism, which is the solution, right? What helps me to be self-aware? When I use the word solution, I'm not saying that a solution for everyone is how I see it in respect to myself, my personal, um, what I call path to resolution as well. So here I'm going to talk about a rock band or a hard, heavy metal band called Scorpions. And the song that I'm gonna I'm referring to is called "Under the Same Sun." I love this song again for the lyrics. Um, so I'm gonna quote two excerpts from this uh, song. It says, "And does it really matter if there's a heaven up above? We sure could use some love." And then he and then the next part would be, "Cause we all live under the same sun. We all walk under the same moon. Then why why can't we live as one?" Wow, and a beautiful song which shows the the unity of humanity or sometimes the common humanity the fact that you and i wake up in the morning and we hope for a great day and we hope for a, we hope for a day where i'm not hurt and if i don't want to be hurt why should i hurt another person and the real point do i need to acknowledge that there is a heaven in the afterlife for me to do some good now that's my question and this song actually ah an amazing question. Does we, do we have to, does it really matter if there's a heaven up above for us to love each other, for us to do good? So do I have to treat you, Josh, kindly because I want to go to heaven right after my death? But do you know what? The sun that is up in the sky, the moon that is up in the clouds are probably more real than my belief in heaven. Because you know why? The existence of heaven is through faith, which I respect. But the existence of the sun and the moon and the world that we live in, the existence of you as a person, Josh, is not subject to my belief. It is something that is immediately evident to me. So uh, respecting that faith that there could be heaven, because I cannot deny that there is no heaven, because I don't know. Um, I, I cannot say that there is no heaven. Can I say that there is heaven? I would say I can't, because I cannot prove heaven neither can I disprove heaven. But I can prove one thing, which is, Josh, that you are a human being, that I'm a human being. And you wake up in the morning hoping for a great day. I wake up in the morning hoping for a great day. You wish happiness. I wish happiness. You don't want suffering. I don't want suffering. That is not subject to disprove. You know, so that is a great message for me. And for that, you know, just acknowledging this, the fact that we all have that same blood, we live in that shared space in this earth. Why can't we just live as one? Right? A great song by Scorpions, in my opinion. It's a great song indeed. And it was one of those which caught me off guard in your selection. <laughs> I saw Black Sabbath, Megadeth, Death. I saw Scorpions, okay. Before I went to the song title, I was thinking, or oh, maybe something from the first five albums. But it's a great song nonetheless. Um, this song, Under the Same Sun, comes from Face the Heat from 1993. And, you know, with the ideas of unity, of uh, harmonious coexistence, um, the idea I got from this song was like calling for humanitarianism, living as one, and also the interconnectedness of humanity. Not only of humanity, but of all sentient beings, even animals and plant life and the ecology of the planet as well. And uh, what was interesting also, like for the history buffs, for example, tuning in, right? So this the first song from this album is called Alien Nation. Alien Nation was about the reunification of Germany in 1990. This album was released in 1993. So it had a lot of themes to do with the reunification of Germany in 1990 and also about a common humanitarianism. 
And the fall of the Berlin Wall also in 1989, you know, the fall of the Iron Curtain and also the USSR and communism as well. So um, I think what um, Klaus Main, you know, when he uh, wrote the lyrics as well, I, and the producers and the band members and Klaus Main who sang the songs, I think it's a kind of a reflection on not getting, it's, it's a political statement. It's probably the most political Scorpions album, but it's not going too extreme. It's about highlighting what's happened, but at the same time, there's hope. It's not all doom and gloom. And this song, you have showed there's optimistic hope that people can be inspired to. And also um, the fact that we all bleed red. Definitely. So we will go to our last songs. Uh, and I think the last songs for both of us will be from our own personal bands. So um, before I go to the last songs, um, I have one song here by Tony K. So I'll go really quickly with this. So Tony K um, is my fourth song uh, in contrast to Cartier Scorpions. Tony K was a trash metal band um, formed in the late 80s. And they were usually classified um, with the Christian trash metal bands. You know, bands like Deliverance and Believer and so on and so forth. And I love a lot of these bands. They had very interesting messages. And I think their approach to heavy and trash metal were very unique. The different melodies and also a lot of them were very progressive at the same time. So, okay, Tony K here, we have the album Stop the Bleeding from 1990. Most of our albums are from this period. So the song is called Arc of Suffering. And the music video actually showed a lot of, um, you know, how we manipulate animals. So it's a song about animal abuse and violence. It's a call for animal rights and protection. And also saying that animal testing is unethical, right? What gives us more right than animals, right? Just, uh, and they mentioned also specifically, God said to, God created all as equal because they're coming from the Christian tradition. God created all as equal, yet he said to, uh, you know, humans to dominate. So they actually questioned this within the song. And they actually are calling more for, equalitarianism and equanimity so they mention in the lyrics do you think dominate means to kill for just for sport wear the fur from their backs train them for circus acts take our pets to be guests once their cute age is passed so these four lines can have different uh point to different things killing for sport and hunting you know we have to look at whether it's ethical whether it's useful especially just for human leisure then uh, using products made from animal skin or fur, uh, manipulation of animals at the expense for human entertainment, and also selective animal lovers. I, you know, many people say they're animal lovers, yet at the same time, it's very selective. It's, oh, puppies are cute, cats are cute, but this, this certain, you know, the like and dislike thing you're talking about, preference. So it's almost a kind of a hip hip hypocrisy, which the song has brought out. So you have all these themes within uh, animal abuse and violence, which I, I think is brilliant. The band, the band has brought out in their debut album in 1990. So I, I, would, I would think that the message we have here is having more compassion towards one another for human beings, for animals. We can also reflect about readjusting our diet, uh, practic practice of ethical restraint, and to be more mindful consumers at the same time. So uh, with that being said, would you like to go into your last song before I go into mine and then we can uh, wrap it up? Yeah, sure, my friend. Uh, so last song is, of course, as, as per your request, a song from the band Rudra, right? The band that I'm part of. So I decided to, it was, a, it was very, very challenging for me to choose one song over the other. And I've chosen this song called uh, Aham Brahmasmi from the Brahma Vidya Primordial Eye um, album. Now, I love this song because this song is, uh, is firstly, the, 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 the term, the name of the song, Aham Brahmasmi, is actually a mantra or a verse from uh, an, a very ancient Upanishad called the Brahadarnika Upanishad. And the, word Aham, and the term Aham Brahmasmi, which is considered to be a great statement because it, it's a very important statement for teaching in the Upanishad tradition. So it literally means, I am Brahman, which means I am everything. I am that very consciousness that has that sustains, that creates, and eventually resolves the universe. So I love this line. And some of, many people may already know, many Rudra fans or people who are very familiar with our lyrics know that we're very much influenced by the Advaita Vedanta philosophy, as well as the uh, Upanishads, which are very ancient Sanskrit texts, which primarily um, influence all of our lyrics. In fact, it influences the whole band, to be honest. Um, so, and, and I've been a very great ardent, um, what I call a uh, student in the tradition of uh, Shankaracharya, uh, Adi Shankara. I think Josh, you may know the, 
uh, his works as well. So this song is actually a presentation of the philosophy of the Upanishads as taught by Shankara or Shankara Acharya. So here I am just going to recite a couple of lines from here. Uh, it says that the world resolves into my senses, the senses resolve in the mind, the mind resolves in the eye, and the eye resolves in the self. What is left to be known once the self is known? What is left to be seen when there's nothing left to see? So this is a very, um, very, for me, this, these lines that I wrote, it is actually an inspiration from the teachings that I resonate very strongly with. In fact, I, I, the vision of the Upanishads is my vision in the way that I, I present it through the lyrics. So this tells us something very interesting, which is the, 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 the very existence that we are in actually is dependent on me, the self. In fact, it, you can resolve the whole universe into the self. And then when you see yourself as being as the substratum of the whole universe, then once this self is known, once you know your, yourself or know the self as just consciousness, there's nothing left to be seen. Actually, there is only the seer, as, as I would say, or as the Upanishad or the tradition of the Advaita Vedanta teaching teachers say. Now, this is not, a, a, to me, this is the vision, right? It's a vision. It's not a belief to me. It's not a philosophy even. It's a way of seeing myself. So this happens to be my final uh, song. Yeah, that's brilliant. And also it's, um, it's like pratyash, you know, direct perception, valid cognizer, right? In the pramanas, you know, the first pramana uh, used in both Advaita Vedanta and also in Buddhism as well, you know, very, inf uh, very important. Um, you know, there's inference and so on and so forth, but direct perception as a valid cognizer. So I think this looks at that, right? What's left to be seen and so on and so forth. So I, I could imagine, you know, with the amount of albums and songs you have written and produced over, you know, coming to 30 years, around 30 years now, it would, it, it would have been difficult to choose one song, you know, because you have songs addressing different philosophical themes and issues across a vast literature of contemplative science and tradition. It's not easy. So I've also used uh, my last example to be a, a, a song or an album I've wrote uh, with, with a couple of friends last year and recorded as well. So Katir plays in a band called Rudra and um, one of the projects I had was a band called Sunyata. So with Sunyata, um, the whole album was based on uh, the teachings of Lama Sunkapa or Jay Sunkapa. So I've also used to the best of my abilities um, when writing the lyrics and the songs to employ study, contemplation and meditation. Sila, Samadhi and Pratnya. Um, within uh, Buddhist tradition, but also within other Indian traditions as well. So I've employed this and, um, you know, I've also, also instructed in certain, by certain teachers on certain parts of the text over the years. So from my experience, I, I chose the song Karma, which is the fourth song. So I've also um, used the text, the stages to the path of enlightenment, the uh, Lambrim Chemno in Tibetan. So this text by Tsongkhapa, he systematized a lot of the teachings of uh, Buddhism, of Tibetan Buddhism, you know, the teachings of the Buddha uh, within Tibetan tradition. And he has actually systematized a lot of various schools because he was a lineage holder in three traditions. And he actually synthesized a lot of it within this uh, stages onto the uh, path of enlightenment. So um, karma was one of the topics in the, in the, in the text as well. And um, I won't spend too much time on this, but just a reflection and just uh, insight that, you know, karma here is re uh, related as volitional actions. So you use actions with the substratum of intention, intended use of action. So volitional actions is used here. And one of my lyrics here was evil deeds lead to suffering. Noble ones live in purity. So my inspiration here, not only from the Lambrim Chenmo, but also from the Dhammapada. You know, how, how was it constructed from the Pali tradition of making this teaching seem not losing the essence, but, but representing it in, a, in at least in a hopefully honorable way, right? Evil deeds lead to suffering. So if we have this kind of thoughts of anguish, anxiety, and if we are, you know, laboring in things of lying, stealing, and, you know, misconduct, right, of body, mind, speech, it will increase our suffering. It will increase our suffering and we can experience it for our own selves. However, if, you know, they've mentioned noble ones live in purity. So noble ones here also mention towards those 
uh, it's mentioning towards those who are bodhisattvas, for example. But at the same time, anyone who partakes in a path can also be considered as a noble one, right? Who has awareness of intention and living in the purity of body, speech, and mind, of our thoughts, our actions, and our speech. So it's very important to understand this uh, causality, you know, and at, at this time, uh, at the same time, causality can teach us of personal self accountability, accountability of self and the environment at the same time. So it's more about the accumulation of karmic, karmic actions registered into consciousness or mind. And at the same time, this is actually propelled by intention and fueled with desire. So we can see big topics here of desire, intention, and also the karmic registration at the same time. So with that being said, um, Kati and I spent about over an hour <laughs> and we have shared about 10 songs from rock and metal. I don't think, I do not know if anyone has done this. Maybe we are one of the first few to do, you know, people who are into contemplative sciences and have released albums, metal albums, at the same time analyzing this and hopefully sharing the fruits of our practice, you know, along the way. So before we conclude, I have one last thing to share with uh, Kati as well. Uh, which I think hopefully can be very beneficial for even both of us and for the people who are viewers as well. How can we incorporate more mindfulness into our creative projects? So whether it's various channels of artistic form and expression. So, you know, like if you are feeling angry, how can we constructively channel it? And at the same time, how can we use mindfulness uh, with creativity? I think it's a great question, um, uh, Joy. So I, 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 I once uh, shared this with someone who could not put out an album because uh, this person uh, with his band, he, they always wanted to, they wanted to put out their first album. So, and the biggest challenge they had was every time they produced a song, um, they decided to just completely ditch it. They felt that it wasn't good. So I told them something very interesting. I said that, you know something, there will never be a time where you will have a great song. But all you need to do is that song that comes out from you. Now, that's a great song. So that would, that would then mean that we need to be non-judgmental when we, when we are creative. Now, when we judge too soon, we stop being creative. So I remember uh, speaking to that same person. I said, when Napalm Death uh, released their, their first album, now, if they judge themselves too soon before they put out that album, you wouldn't have a genre called grindcore today. Now, the fact that they were able to put out that first album without judging themselves with those very short songs, and at that time, it's very amazing for a band to put that out, and that created, that created a new genre, right? So here, the whole idea is to be creative would then mean that we don't judge ourselves too hard. Now, in fact, the song that comes out of you, that tune that comes out of you is meant to be that acceptance, that non-judgment. When, when we bring that into our songwriting, now that's when we grow as a musician. That's when we grow as a band because what is right there in front of you is meant to be right there. With that acceptance and with that, with that uh, non-judgmental stance, we then become creative. We then become innovative because now with that substratum, with that foundation of what you have in front of you, you can now build that beautiful song that you have. And yeah, that's the trick in my opinion, right? Uh, let go of that judgments and then uh, be, bring acceptance. And one simple way of doing that could be to exercise mindfulness in whatever that you do. Bring more awareness to what you're doing. Bring more attention to what you're doing. And learning to accept that what is, what, what is right now is what is. And in any given moment when you are writing a song or you're playing with a band, just be with that present moment. And that allows you to then appreciate what you have instead of trying to critically evaluate or assess what you have, which then leads you to come to the conclusion that you are not good or the song is not good. Both are judgments. Thank you for the beautiful exposition, you know, to summarize, uh, you know, what we've been doing for over an hour, but also uh, what we encompass, you know, in our way of uh, living the path. And you mentioned about self-acceptance uh, self and also non-judgment. You know, some of the modern writers also look at this as radical self-acceptance as well. 
you know, accepting things uh, without this kind of discrimination. So self-acceptance is very important, especially for people who have low self-esteem or, you know, feel really low or depressed and all this. So actually, it's very important to, uh, you know, what, what Katir has mentioned here as well. Um, you know, Katir, thanks so much for doing this episode. Um, it's been a real joy having you and to share about our passions. You know, um, I think it's uh, to share music in a way where we are expressing our joy for the songs, but at the same time, there are useful lessons we can be very mindful of and incorporate in our practice. Um, so I will include links. Um, there will be links for Kati's work with Rudra um, in the YouTube description. I will also include um, the Facebook page for Rudra, the Bandcamp, and so on and so forth. And uh, at the same time, I'd like to give a, a, a quick shout out also to, to Vinod of Rudra as well, who, you know, he's played with Rudra for several years and he contributed a guitar solo for one of my band's Sanity Obscure as well on the song Technomancer. So he's been one of my guitar idols here in Singapore. I'd like to shout out to him and also to Heli Andrea who from Mobius as well, who sang on uh, Sanity Obscure songs as well and has collaborated with Katiro Rudra as well. So we have all these various commonalities which I would like to highlight as well. So Kati, any last uh, words before we, we fold here? And just that uh, thanks to everyone who took the time to listen to our conversation. So much of um, interesting insights. And um, yeah, glad that you could uh, spend some time listening to our conversation. That's it. And be well, stay well, and uh, stay safe. Thank you, Kati, once again. And I hope more mindfulness and more metal for all of you. Thank you.